I'm here today to talk about communication strategies that we used in our transition from Blackboard to Canvas. As uh, she mentioned, uh, I come from the University of Pennsylvania and our library has managed courseware centrally, uh, both user support and backend support since 2005. From 2000 to 2005, it was managed by the schools, particularly the schools of engineering. And then in 2005, the library acquired it and it's been managed centrally ever since. There's no mandate at, for, at Penn for courseware, so instructors aren't required to use a specific system or a single system, and there's been a lot of uh, different systems concurrently in use across campus at the same time. So in terms of Blackboard, we have um, eight schools that we supported through that system, arts and sciences, engineering, social policy and practice, design, dental medicine, education, nursing, communication, and biomedical graduate studies, which was a subset of our School of Medicine. In addition to that, we had several homegrown systems, also concurrently in use at the School of Business, the Law School, and the School of Medicine. Finally, our veterinary school used Moodle. So it's like Pokemon. We have one of every single system being used. If you're a student, there might have been two or more places you had to log into to get your course materials, and of course, a lot of confusion among students over where you're supposed to go to get things. We began uh, looking into Canvas. Uh, additionally, the Wharton School of Business moved off of their homegrown platform to Canvas in 2012. Our School of Education, which we'd previously supported on Blackboard, then made the decision to move to Can Canvas in 2012. Based on uh, these moves and also just interest across the university in platforms other than Blackboard, the provost asked the libraries to look into additional systems. So we piloted several systems. We piloted Sakai CLE in fall 2011, which was well received, but not compelling enough to go through the agony of a migration between systems. We piloted Canvas in fall 2012, which obviously worked out great. And we attempted to pilot Sakai OAE before, of course, it imploded on itself uh, one week into the semester because they lost all their funding. So that was the pilot that never happened, and Canvas was the pilot that never ended. <laughs> So we finally made the decision to move to Canvas, and not just from Blackboard to Canvas, but to one centralized Canvas instance. So the two schools that had migrated before we started our Canvas pilot had two separate Canvas instances. So we were going to make the decision to not only move from Blackboard to Canvas, but to take those two instances and merge them into one centralized Canvas instance to you know, rule them all, basically. With, of course, uh, the caveat of the law school decided to remain on a separate Canvas instance and the vet school chose to remain on Moodle, but it achieved the goal of one central learning management system for all undergraduates at Penn. So the plan to do this uh, came together pretty quickly. We made the decision in spring 2013 to move and signed a contract in June 2013 and chose to do the whole migration in a year. So July 2013 was essentially our staging area. We did all of our training for administrators, sub-account administrators, support providers, train the trainer for anyone who was volunteered or voluntold, which is our term for when your boss volunteers you for something, to help teach workshops and host office hours, all of our support staff. And at this point, only designated cohorts were permitted to migrate. And we tried to identify good groups for this, like language courses math courses where you know, there's lots and lots of sections and one template that they would use to create a site. August 2013 was our open call for Canvas. Our course request form went live. Anybody could begin requesting sites. And we did tons of workshops. Pretty much all business hours through the month of August, we had one seminar room booked and we did alternating workshops and office hours to make it as easy as possible for people to come in and get hands-on support. Fall 2013, Blackboard would be optional, but of course Canvas would be strongly encouraged. Spring 2014, Canvas was the only option for some schools unless you were retiring, and the schools really had the ability to make that kind of decision, and everyone else was just strongly, strongly encouraged to use Canvas. May 19th was our merge date, so those two separate Canvas instances were going to be merged into ours on May 19th. May 30th was when we turned off user access to Blackboard, and June 30th is the date when we will pull the plug forever, and I'm very much looking forward to that. <laughs> so to accomplish uh, all of this work, we put together several teams. At the top level, we have the Courseware Management Group, which is the first such management group for Courseware to ever have existed at Penn, which was all of the IT heads of the schools, our central computing office, the libraries, representatives from the provosts, among others. 
Then below that is the Course War Working Group, which was essentially a reimagining of our partners group, which had had representatives from all the Blackboard schools, and then we expanded it to include the Canvas institutions and um, people from other groups on campus as well, to make it a really robust group that could you know, funnel communication to users and work together to complete this work. Below that is our Blackboard to Canvas migration team, which is a team that basically investigated and chose the timeline for our migration, and then it had several sub-teams. Our communication team, which I'll talk about today, a technical team, and a training and documentation team. So our communication team consisted of representatives from a lot of different groups. Uh, at the libraries, our coursework team consisted of three people. <laughs> Um, so we, of course, needed more help to complete the migration and to put together a really good communication plan. So we had one representative of our team, two members of the library's communication and strategic planning team, one of the deans of the School of Arts and Sciences, who's also their director of academic affairs, a representative from the School of Nursing, and a representative from the provost office. So they put together a really robust plan for communicating everything that was going to be happening about the change to our users. It had goals, specific audiences in mind. It involved a lot of our partners as ways of communicating what was happening to people. It focused on both pre and post contract communications, which are two very different animals, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And everything they did was considered to be a tactic. It had a specific audience and a specific deadline. And this really enabled them to put together a robust communication plan before we ever had a contract signed, because all you had to do was keep changing those deadline dates, and you could keep moving forward. The specific goals that they identified was to raise awareness of the transition and to connect our members to whatever resources they would need to either migrate or to just start using Canvas if they were students. And there were specific audiences that they identified that we needed to communicate to, and this is really important to do at the beginning just so you make sure you're not missing anybody. So they included, of course, faculty, which was our main audience, support staff, which is a pretty broad category at Penn that I'll define in a minute, our students, and then our general campus population, because we have a lot of people that it's good for them to be aware of what's being done in terms of courseware, or they might be using courseware for other purposes, special programs, events, et cetera, and they need to be aware of what's happening. In terms of support staff, we have a lot of them, and they're all very good at migration. We have our Blackboard Partners Group. We have local support providers, which is our term for IT folks at the schools. They have really good relationships with faculty, and. They were so wonderful during this whole migration. If someone needed someone to go to their office, like today or in five minutes, they could take care of that. Librarians, we run courseware out of the libraries, but I can't plug working with librarians enough. They also have great relationships with the faculty. They will forward messages to anyone you want them to and will be willing to spread the word in any way that they can. We also worked with our Center for Teaching and Learning, which is a group on campus that focuses on teaching excellence. So we worked with them through seminars and other communications. And then finally, our information commons, which is the most high-tech area of the library. A lot of really helpful folks contributed to this project. Pre-contract messaging. This was actually the most difficult part of the transition because our negotiations went on for what felt like forever. And we were, of course, being asked what was happening on a daily basis by people at all levels of the university. And it got to the point where there are so many rumors being spread and ridiculous things that people were saying that we had to send out a message basically saying that campus was probably coming, this is our plan, and we made sure that it went to our support partners who then forwarded it to their staff because they too were, of course, getting these questions on a daily basis. Additionally, we sent out a nice list of talking points. So if librarians, support staff, anybody got questions, they knew how to answer them. So it was simple things like what's happening with Canvas and then a little answer that they could share with faculty and made them feel more empowered and involved in the process. Post-contract messaging. Hooray. So the important things to do once you have a contract and a plan is to create messages that are both reusable and that can be campus-wide. We put an announcement in the Almanac, which is our pen journal of record that all that kind of important stuff happens in. And we also uh, had several articles in the Daily Pennsylvanian, which is our student newspaper. And in preparation for these announcements, we also put together a list of vetted faculty that anyone in the media could contact to talk about Canvas. So that way, when that question came up, who can I talk to who's used Canvas, we had a list of faculty who were already comfortable talking about it and being contacted for that purpose. One of the things we did uh, was put together this nice little Canvas postcard that could be distributed at workshops, office hours, put in faculty mailboxes, dropped off at service points, and it was also available in digital form, so for the buildings that had computer monitors and lobbies and things like that, they could project it. And it's a nice 
little card summarizing what's great about Canvas, information how to get involved, all that kind of thing on one side. And then on the other, we have a nice little timeline of the transition, how it's going to happen, and all of that. And this was really well received. People love these. I have tons of extras if you'd like to take one home. Um, the only drawback to this is the URL. We began with the domain name of upenn.instructure.com, but then decided to change it to canvas.upenn.edu because that's a lot nicer. And we didn't realize that canvas.upenn.edu slash about would redirect to your Canvas profile page. <laughs> so that was the only hiccup that we encountered with these. But other than that, I mean, they were a great tool to kind of advertise what was happening. They were very attractive. And I think they were very successful at getting that message out. Additionally, we also used Constant Contact to put together a newsletter, which let us reuse existing things and then push them out in another format to people. And we auto-subscribed everybody on our partners list to this, and many of them forwarded it to their partners because it gave them updates on where things were, information, and it was really simple to put together because we were really using things that already existed. So it wasn't a huge amount of effort. It was just another way to keep repeating the same messaging to our users. Additionally, we also had a Canvas blog that we put together. It's just a simple WordPress blog that had updates about things, you know, directions that are simple and streamlined. I still send people to this screenshot for requesting your Canvas site because it's the best set of directions we've ever written for that. Um, and again, we auto-subscribe everyone on our partners list to this, so every time there's a new post, they push it out. And I think it's really important with communication to find people who are good at it and who enjoy it. I'm not a fan of blogging, but I have people on my team that love it, so we put together a blog and let them go to town, and they put together some really great content. Additionally, internal communication is also important. We put together a Canvas support site for all of our partners, where we basically kept track of different documents and other items. Um, it was a great thing to use because obviously it's all about Canvas, so they're forced to use Canvas when they're talking about the migration. Um, and we put together some documents that really helped keep it organized. We put together a local support provider, FAQ. Again, just simple questions and answers that they could use so they felt empowered and that they understood what was going on. And we also put together a Google Doc of migration plans by school, which was really helpful for keeping track, especially since some schools had very specific plans, like mandating that you had to use Canvas in our spring term, for example. And it was just a simple document with the name of the school, the name of the appropriate contact person, and what their plan is. Because honestly, after a one-year migration, towards the end, you can't remember what school decided what. So having it in a simple document that you can reference, that everyone can access, really helps you keep organized. We also made an effort in our documentation to keep it really easy. And this is a page we often referred faculty to in a lot of our communications, which is two simple questions. When should I migrate? How should I migrate? Because I think there's a lot of sort of frustration and fear that comes up when you say you have to migrate between systems. So keep it as simple as possible. And this is something we reused over and over again because it's just so simple and to the point about the whole process. Another important group to include in your communication to some extent is faculty and their peers. Because when faculty talk to each other, it's a lot different than when you talk to faculty. So sometimes having faculty who can be advocates or who really like the system to talk about it, it really does a lot to encourage other faculty to try it and to feel more comfortable the, about the migration. We put together a, a series of faculty reflection videos. So for anyone who participated in our Canvas pilot, we interviewed them. You know, what do you like about Canvas? They showed their actual Canvas site, and then they just talked about what they liked, how they used it, and we posted these in our Canvas 001 site, which is a public site that anyone can access, and we would share those in our different communications as, you know, we're moving to Canvas, here's some faculty who really liked it. Our Center for Teaching and Learning also hosted a faculty-to-faculty -faculty lunch on the theme of teaching with Canvas, where again, pilot participants came and talked to their peers about their experiences with Canvas, and that was actually really well attended, and we got a really good discussion going about the pros and the cons of the system. And again, having faculty talk to each other is in a lot of cases better than you talking to faculty, because it's just a different relationship. Finally, we put together a Canvas showcase, which was a day of workshops and other events, including a faculty panel, where again, people who'd used Canvas talked about it, and it was well attended by both people who'd already migrated and those who'd migrated and just wanted to learn how to do things differently. The other thing we had to communicate in addition, in addition to just the Blackboard to Canvas part is our Canvas instance merge, or as I like to call it, the great conjunction, like in the dark crystal, because we had two instances <laughs> merging into one final instance. And there were a lot of concerns with that. It had never really been done before by anyone, so it was a huge project. Um, 
Our biggest concern at the libraries was the issue of downtime and access for our users. It was essentially decided that the two other environments would become unavailable and then their users would be blacklisted from our environment. But of course that involved a lot of communication back and forth, not only in the technical end, but also when, when these people write to us in, in, a, you know, in a panic because they can't get into Canvas, what do we do? So we worked really extensively with our partners at the business school and the School of Education in addition to Instructure and this project kind of went off without a hitch, no major catastrophes or anything and now we're all in one happy instance together. The biggest thing moving forward is just dealing with post-merge support issues and processes because as you can imagine having three different instances we often have three different ways of doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so trying to figure out wh what's the best way of doing things to sort of achieve the goal of having one instance for everybody and it being as easy as possible for our users. Student access to Blackboard was kind of the last big thing we had to communicate. We pulled it uh, just a few weeks ago on May 30th at 5 p.m. and we wanted to communicate to students that this was happening because we weren't going to be enabling access to Blackboard again for them unless there was a grade dispute or um, they were working on an incomplete. It was just the end for them. <laughs> So we emailed all students from 2008 to present using the Blackboard email all students tool. That worked well in the sense that we reached everyone, but it didn't occur to us that there were a lot of faculty from other institutions who may have been in sites of ours for collaborative purposes. So we really freaked out a few faculty members who thought that their institution had decided to black move off Blackboard completely out of the blue for no reason. Because <laughs> of course we didn't put University of Pennsylvania Blackboard in, in the message because why would we? Anyway, so that was the only hiccup with that, but people got the message and we got a surprising amount of uh, faculty responses to this message from our own faculty. So again, it kind of reinforced the transition to those users. There were also some communications that went out at the school level and then we put a system-wide announcement on Pen and Touch, which is the student resource for everything, you know, registration and dining and all of that, as well as in Blackboard and in Canvas. I'm a big fan of system-wide announcements. I think that they're a great way of communicating these large-scale things to people. And then we also put a note on the registrar's homepage and in Ask Ben, which is this nice little question and, off, uh, question and answer software that the uh, registrar has for both registrar questions and financial questions. The only hiccup with this is we became, of course, the first email address on the registrar's homepage. So we got a lot of questions about transcripts and other things, but we managed to resolve that by writing a knowledge base article in our ticketing system so we could just route those people back to the registrar for their transcripts but it meant that people were at least seeing our message. <laughs> um, yeah. So in terms of the benefits of a good strategy, uh, one of the things that's important is that you control the message and you know it's accurate. Before we had a contract, there were all sorts of ridiculous things that people would say to us that they had heard about the transition and when it was happening. And the more messaging you put out there, you control it, you know that it's accurate and that people are getting the right information about timelines and deadlines and things like that. People know who to contact. I think uh, we got a lot of responses every time a new message would go out, whether it was an email or an announcement from people who either hadn't reached before or from people who had realized that we were serious about this and maybe they needed to think about migrating. And I think people are a lot more willing to follow up with us now. We went to a lot of meetings and other events so they know who we are. We're not just the disembodied you know, computer that runs Canvas for people. I think it's really improved our standing at Penn. Surprises. So at some point in your migration, something is going to go horribly wrong. It might be a technical problem. It might be something else. For us, it was something I don't think we could have anticipated. And it basically exploded on a day that my boss was out sick and we had a Blackboard system failure in the morning. <laughs> so it was already a chaotic day before this issue had cropped up. And having a good communication plan in place and knowing who to talk to really helped us get an accurate message out as fast as possible and kind of clamp down on this issue before it became a complete catastrophe. So I would highly recommend having a plan because you might need to know how to reach people at the provost's office or your office of general counsel or whomever urgently. And if you already have that communication in place, it's a lot easier to resolve these emergencies. So lessons learned. Meeting minutes are a necessary evil. All of our different teams and sub-teams kept meeting minutes. Uh, it's a good record of knowing who was at meetings, when they happened, what decisions were made, and what timelines were. I've had three different bosses over the last year, so having meeting minutes as a record really helped for onboarding and for keeping track of what happened, when it happened, etc. Because by the time you reach the tail end of a migration, you're not going to remember. So having detailed records really helps keep track of what happened and when. It's not possible to over-communicate. Every time we would send out a new blast or a new message, 
we would have more responses from users that either hadn't reached before or they hadn't paid attention before. I was actually in a meeting once where someone complained about all the messages they were getting about Canvas, and I thought, yes, it's annoying. That's exactly what we want. People are hearing it, at least. Um, you should talk to peer institutions. We did this a lot in our planning phases, and we stole a lot of their ideas. The little postcard was one that we stole. Um, talking to those, both who are like you in size and also in scope, can you give you a good idea of what would make sense for your institution? It's really important to collaborate and get feedback. For a lot of the messages, we would share them with our partners before we sent them out. A lot of our partners would write messages and share them with us before they sent them out. For a lot of the schools, they weren't really comfortable writing their own messaging, but for those who were, the only thing we asked was just copy us on what you send so we know what was said. And it was also helpful in, in terms of tone because some of the messages we, on the first draft would be a little bit doom and gloom, like Blackboard is ending, you have to move to Canvas, as opposed to there are all these great features about Canvas, you should be excited, it's a good thing. So the more eyes you have on a message, the better it turns out, tends to be in the end at least. And it's really important to make communication easy. We wrote a lot of messages that people could just forward onto their users or could customize and then forward onto their users because a lot of the people we work with, courseware isn't their primary responsibility or they wouldn't feel knowledgeable or comfortable enough to write their own messaging. So we made it as easy as possible and then just reuse the content over and over again. The more places that you can put it, the better. So that's how we accomplished our migration in a year. We pulled the plug on Blackboard on June 30th. Hooray. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them or you can follow up with me later. So the question was, how did we deal with data retention with pulling the plug on Blackboard? Um, so we backed up all of our courses uh, as archives from 2008 to present and store them on a server in the library. And they can be um, shared with partners or shared with faculty upon request or, of course, migrated into Canvas. Our biggest concern was how to deal with grade disputes because the Blackboard Grade Center obviously doesn't restore into Canvas when you migrate. So what we did is our School of Arts and Sciences, one of their IT folks, figured out how to crack a Blackboard archive. So there is a way to get grades out of an archive, and it's not a pretty or easily usable format, but it's there. So that's how we dealt with grade disputes. And then we store all course sites um, for five years from the term in which we were taught. And then we uh, contact the schools and see if they want to store them locally, and if they say no, then we delete them. Um, we migrated, uh, basically we had the faculty make the decision on whether they wanted to migrate their content or start from scratch or use some other combination of that. Uh, we had a course request form where faculty could log in and download the files and then directions were sent to them via email of how to upload that into Canvas. Some of the schools hired extra support staff to do it for them, but for the smaller schools uh, we relied on the faculty to at least try it once and then if they had problems we would step in and assist them. <laughs> so the question was uh, getting people to agree on a common message and work together towards that. We found that people were more often than not willing to work together and excited about the prospect of working together and even surprised how willing we were to want to work with them. <laughs> um, getting a common message, there were often you know, some, not really resistance, but debates about language and wording and, and things like that, which, uh, which we expected, but it was a lot smoother of a process than we anticipated and everyone has said to me how, how, much, how better this went than they had expected, all the projects, um, including the instance merge, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, so um, the question was about the different groups. Um, so the Coursera management groups is the head of the uh, heads of IT of the different schools, including representatives from our central computing office, the provost office, and the libraries. And then the Coursera working group used to just be the Blackboard Partners group, which I have always chaired. And it's basically just the local support providers in the schools. So it consists of IT folks, librarians, other staff. They're not really decision makers, but um, they would give us a lot of input on what was happening on the ground, and they have a lot of experience working with users. And a lot of the people on the working group, their bosses are on the management group. <laughs> Uh, a lot of times the working group would ask the management group for approval on things. We would come up with a plan or an idea and we would need them to sign off on it. And then the course where our management group would often push things to us, like we need a plan for this and we need to come up with a workflow for this. And there was a lot of back and forth. My boss is on the management group and I also take their meeting minutes. So I'm in those meetings even though I'm not a member. <laughs> Sure. Uh, the question was about our pilots and evaluating them. We have a strategic planning office in the libraries and they did most of the evaluation. It was, it was basically done through surveys and faculty interviews. So they took charge of that process. So there was a lot of data they acquired through surveying faculty and students and then through interviews, a lot of sort of anecdotal and qualitative data. And can, uh, Sakai was pretty well received. It just wasn't compelling enough or different enough from Blackboard to constitute the move. And after that, pilot the following year we did the pilot of Canvas and the attempted pilot of Sakai OAE and it was more of the same faculty interviews, student and faculty surveys so that there was data and at the end of both pilots we wrote reports and shared them with what would become the courseware management group of how things had gone. <coughs> I'm the head of the training and documentation team, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, that team consisted of folks from the libraries, the School of Nursing, Arts and Sciences, uh, among others. And our task was to basically come up with a plan for training, our, not only training users, but training staff and um, anyone who'd be doing training for us, and also all of the documentation. So we basically built on our experiences from Blackboard and tried a lot of new things. We did workshops online. We did extended office hours until 7 o'clock at night, which nobody came to. Um, it was a really interesting experience, and I think we came up with some good documentation, which of course is in the constant stage of being revised, not only with the Canvas releases, but also because as we've gone on, we've realized what works better um, versus what we've tried before. <coughs> We do both. Um, so we refer to the Canvas guides whenever we can, but then we have a lot of pen-centric documentation based on the things that we know our users have been asking. Um, for example, we had a lot of really detailed course setup documentation, and then the complaint was, well, this is too complicated. So we put together a page that was eight simple ways of setting up your Canvas site, just very simple step-by-step -step instructions. That was based on our experiences working with faculty who found more detailed documentation confusing. Pretty high. Um, uh, there had been dissatisfaction with, uh, the question was uh, who decided to move off Blackboard. <laughs> um, there had been general dissatisfaction with Blackboard for a long time, kind of across the university. A lot of issues, both technical and non-technical, with running the system. And with the success that both our Wharton School and our Education School had had with Canvas, that sort of suggested that we should be looking at other systems. And then the provost sort of made it an initiative that we should look into other options. And we did look into the Blackboard hosted version. So we didn't just you know, decide not to use Blackboard. Um, and then you know, there was an investigation phase and then we piloted several and Canvas came out the winner. Mm 
So the question was about our Canvas showcase. Um, we picked a date in the spring, we picked April 9th, uh, which is kind of a month out from the end of our semester, so not so late in the semester that faculty would be thinking about next semester or just worried about grading. Um, <clears throat> and I think the rest of it was just based on availability of spaces. And we had attendance I'm not sure how many of them were tenured versus non-tenured, but there were a lot of faculty from different schools, some who I knew had migrated already, and others who had yet to migrate, and this was sort of another fact-finding event for them. And it was really well-received, and I think having the faculty panel at the beginning was really what people wanted, more so than the workshops and the office hours, because they like to hear you know, what their peers have done. The question was, did we seek any feedback from the students after the migration? Uh, we had planned to do a survey to both faculty and students about the migration, but due to everything else happening in May, like the instance merge and the pulling the plug on Blackboard, it ended up not happening. And that's the one thing I would have done differently if we'd had more time and more staff would be to send that out. But um, in general, students were very excited about the fact that they only had to go to one place. <laughs> So the question was about migrating content. Um, basically, the way that it worked is when you logged into our request form, you had the option to pick from a dropdown what course you wanted to migrate content from. And then once your course site was created in Canvas, you would get an email giving you directions on how to access the Blackboard export and how to do the import yourself. If, uh, depending on the school that someone was from, our arts and science in school in particular had hired people to do the migration since they're our biggest customer. Um, so in those cases, we would in, you usually just add it to a document and let them know that this is another one where things need to be migrated. For the smaller schools, um, unless we heard back from the faculty, we assumed that they had just completed it on their own. We did office hours uh, where anyone who had questions could come, um, but everything else was workshops that were a big groups for the most part, both in person and online. Any other questions? All right, well, if you have any other questions, feel free to follow up with me, and if you want a postcard, please come get one.